Hello, this is Alan Shipnuck back for another Fire Drill podcast. We have Michael Bamberger coming in hot from Ponte Vedra Beach, the final round of the players. I just read your story, Michael, which is uh, going to populate on firepitcollective.com any second now. Of, I love the way you talked about Scotty Scheffler as a throwback, the way he moves, the way he plays, the way he carries himself. Uh, you know, we've been it's been almost a year now since his Masters win, and we're, we're still getting to know Scheffler. But what... What is you? You seem to have some affection for the guy. What do you think about his performance today and, and his place in the game right now? I like your use of the phrase. We seem to be getting to know Scheffler, as if there is a Scheffler that one can get to know. Uh, in other words, <laughs> I don't have the sense that he's a very complicated person. I do have the sense that he's a very intelligent person, but not someone who makes things more complicated than they are. But like early on, before we even like heard him in press conferences, we thought, oh, this guy's a dullard. He's not a dullard at all. He's a thoughtful, he just seems like a thoughtful, kind, considerate person who's outstanding at golf and doesn't care that his swing is, you know, not textbook. Uh, for whatever reason, he doesn't inspire you with awe like a Rory or a Dustin Johnson or a John Rahm. Like definitely a level below that just in terms of how he goes about his business and the shots that he plays. But how can you argue with a master's contending all the time now with players and six wins in 13 months? Yeah. Incredible. And if, you know, to me, it was really the Ryder cup was when that was the breakthrough watching him, you know, John Rom was, was playing some of the best golf in the, in the history of mankind that week. And Scheffler took him down in, in, in singles and, that was to me the beginning of the ascent. So yeah, I mean, he's been doing it now for a year and a half straight. And five birdies with the with the players, five birdies in a row with the players' championship hanging in the balance. I mean, that's pretty spectacular. And um, what was what was the feeling like there at at the stadium course? But the for just my personal feeling is, if you see him over a six footer and we're playing make or miss, I find myself saying miss more than make. <laughs> They go in 100%. When he wins, they go in 100% of the time. They don't go in, you know, as you have observed, Alan, of Tiger. Like, Tiger would be annoyed if they didn't go in the right part of the hole. This guy seems to be happy if he goes in any part of the hole. It's just not, it's just not, uh, it's just not beautiful, but it's, uh, it's great. And I am definitely, I'm just trying to speak honestly about him, but I'm definitely in the fan camp. I root for this guy. I love the fact that he, uh, he doesn't talk about money. He doesn't, you know, Rory's got a role in this game right now. And the subtext of that role is hard for a lot of people to swallow when you get right down to it, which is the elite golfers have to get paid more money. Now, I don't know how Scotty Scheffler as an elite player couldn't think that, but he's not, he's the beneficiary of Rory's conversation and Phil's outbursts and Saudi billions and all the rest, but he's sort of either risen above it or is floating aside it. I'm not sure how do you, you would describe it, but it's just not a central part of his character, and it's it's very winning. What, what, what do you think, Alan? Yeah, or he just won four point six million dollars, and any normal human being would be like, this is an incredible amount of money. I am so stoked. <laughs> like, right. I don't need to ask for more. I don't need to throw a fit. Like, I'm so happy. I think, I think to your point, he's kind of a normal guy. It's like, he must be in disbelief the amount of money he's won in 13 months, um, tens of millions of dollars. I think what you just said, Alan, just speaks to a, a, a relatively, not relatively, a normal value system. You know, how much does any person need? And, uh, you know, of course, part of his thing for us, you know, uh, he's, he's 26 you, you, and he hasn't been around very long. So it's not like, well, we've been seeing this guy for years, like Rory's young, but he has been around for a long time, but he really truly seems like he's well into his mid, mid thirties. Uh, um, Alan, did, did you, uh, did, did you happen to notice the comparison to Steve Jones I loved that. Yeah. That in, in Michael's story, he, he talked about how, how Shuffler moves and looks like Steve Jones and has the same no nonsense. Cause 
the 96 us open at Oakland Hills was my second ever us open. And Oh wow. It's, that, was that 96? Yeah. Yeah. It's burned into my brain. And I had honestly never even heard of Steve Jones going into that week. You know, he'd had that finger injury and he'd, he'd kind of fallen off and I was so impressed by the guy. He just seemed like, as you're saying, he just seemed like a regular dude who was really, really good at golf. And that was the, the U S open. Everyone came apart, you know, Davis loved three putted the same second hole and Tom Lehman messed up the last hole. And Jones just was just played golf and got it done. And I think it's a fabulous comparison. They, they, there is a similarity there. And I mean, and that, Steve that, Jones, that you know, broad shouldered lankiness and, uh, yeah, you know, Steve, jo- did, what was Steve's thing later? Did he fall off of a motorbike or something? And Never was really quite the same after that, but that, he was a he was a super talent. Well, no, that predated that oh, predated, predated the US that Open predated win, it, and he had to learn to play golf again. Yeah, and he, but that was for a guy like Steve Jones, winning the U.S. Open was the pinnacle, and I think at that point he was content. But I think Scotty Scheffler, it you can't get to number one in the world without having like a deep reservoir of ambition, but. You know, John John Rom obsesses about being number one, and it, it it meant a lot to to Dustin. You know, he was very prideful about it, and um, you know, Tiger and those guys. Like, I don't think Scotty Scheffler cares about that stuff so much. He just wants to hit golf shots and get the ball in the hole as fast as possible. And if you do that at the level he's doing it, everything comes your way: the money, the world ranking points, the fame, the glory. But if you focus on those things, it's easy to lose your way. So he seems to have just the absolute perfect disposition. Like. I'm just going to play golf and whatever comes my way, I'm going to enjoy. So it's impressive. Yeah. That, that obsessive interest with becoming number one, it's insane. Uh, because it, it means that you're putting so much faith in the architects of the system in the first place, putting more faith in them than you are what you've achieved. Uh, I mean, to me, I mean, what's fun right now is you can argue John Rahm, you can argue Scotty Shuffer. If you care to, you can argue Rory or, or somebody else, but that's part of the fun of being a sports fan. I, I don't need a computer driven logarith- uh, logarithmic explanation of who number one is. Uh, I'll decide for myself. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's all about math and they change it every couple of years. So it is, it is funny when people obsess about it. like you're literally, these guys couldn't even pass algebra in high school and now all they care about is a math equation. It makes no sense at all. But have you ever, have you ever heard a, a real number about what a guy gets contractually, what it might mean to him to, to, to become the number one player for a week. And then, you know, I'm sure beyond that, the more weeks you have that, the more money you're going to make. It, it's a real bonus in, in a lot of contracts and it, it can be half a million. It can be a million. I mean, it's not inconsequential, but again, if you're getting to world number one, you're winning so many tournaments and making so much money. I don't think that bonus is going to change your life, but um, t- to the point about number one, it, it's quite an interesting debate because, you know, Rory's been playing at an incredibly high level. John Rahm has been on a tear, but if, if you're going to really debate who's number one, to me, it comes down to, to Cam Smith and, and Scotty Scheffler because they've each have won the crown jewel of the sport in the last 12 months, a green jacket and an old course at the open. They've also each is one of players. And obviously we haven't seen a lot of Smith, but he went down to Australia in December. He won down there. Like, um, so it's funny that there's been so much focus on Rom and Rory, but I think they're looking at the wrong guys. I mean, if, if, if I had to pick, one dude to go out and win a tournament right now to save my life, it's going to be, it's probably going to be Scotty Scheffler. And number two is probably Cam Smith, depending on the setup, even though I love Rory and I love Rom's game, but they're get the other two guys are just getting it done when it matters most more recently. So, uh, but it, it's quite a conversation because you have, you have four strong candidates. It's neat. I'm, I'm right there with you. And I would probably, as you say, it would really depend on the, on the course, but I would say this, the trickier and shorter the course the more I'm going down the Cam Smith road and for really, for real long, for, for a master's pick, if you could only choose between those two, this is wacky for me to say, uh, but I would go with Cam Smith. I mean, when you can chip and pitch and putt like he can hits it plenty far enough. Uh, he, I, it, it, it would be amazing for those who are, for anybody who's writing a book about live golf, if Cam Smith should win the master's, I can't say I'm rooting for it because, you know, as you know, Alan, as we've discussed many times, really a traditionalist at heart. But I don't know. 
Cam Smith in full, you know, and I saw it up close at the old course uh, in, in last year at the Players. It's one of the it's one of the best you'll ever see. It, it's a little wild at driving at times, but for getting in the hole, it's it's at the Alothable Sevy level. Yeah, so a few people have made the Tom Watson comparison, which I like as well. And, yeah, uh, but how about for you, Alan? If you could, uh, leaving aside your book interest, if you could, if you as a as a gambler, if you could only, if your only choice was Scheffler or Smith, um, which of those two golfers would you pick to win the Masters? Well, if if the course is really firm and fast, it's Smith every time. Um, if they get the you know the early week showers, which seems to factor in a lot of Masters, uh, and it just takes a little fire out, I would go Scheffler. But Scheffler still has a, a genius for scoring. I mean, he just he just has a knack for pulling off the shot when you need to, and yeah, I mean, you could see it today during the final round. It, it's, I mean, there's 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 sluggers. And you, you watch him hit the ball and it's awe-inspiring and they shoot 71. And then there's a guy like Scotty Scheffler who's, whose footwork's all over the place, who the club's flying and weird, but he just he plays shots and he gets the ball in the hole really fast. And I don't think, you know, if you, if you put Scotty Scheffler on the range at a Corn Ferry event, people would think he's probably 100th on the money list. You know, it's not, as you said, it's not beautiful, but he just he just knows how to score and he knows how to do it when it matters. And Cam Smith's the same way. I mean, that, that's a certain level of genius. And I'm not sure even Rory has that. You know, he he can overpower a golf course. But, you know, I walked every every hole with him at, at the old course on Sunday, and that was all about scoring. You know, you're going to drive it near the green on half the par fours at least. And he couldn't get it up and down, and Cam Smith could. And that was really the difference. I mean – there's just, you know, Jordan Spieth, when he's playing well, he's got that. There's there's a magic to the scoring that is hard to quantify, even with shot link. And Scotty Scheffler has it. It's just really fun to watch. Alan, may I pose a question to you apropos of the evening? Yes. Why are there so few good golf movies? And one might say there are none. <laughs> Yeah, it is Academy Awards night. You may hear some shouting in the background. That, that's my daughters watching, and they're very invested in who wins and loses some of these categories, which is cute. Um, it's just part of it is because it's such a highly specific skill, and no actor can can master it, right? Like, I don't know. I, I it it just it lacks that that verisimilitude, right? And the the, what's compelling about golf is the inner game, which is hard to capture. And it, it's that, that sense of when a big moment and it's dead quiet and the whole world's watching. And it, it's just, it's so, the battle is so internal. And, you know, this, the sports movies that, that work, they're funny, like Bull Durham, or there, there's a lot of, they're heavy, like um, Raging Bull, or I don't know. I, I I don't think golf has those notes that well. I mean, Tin Cup kind of, Tin Cup worked as almost as a, co- you know, it's sort of just like comedy that, that golf was a vehicle for. I, I guess it's a golf movie, but I, I don't take the golf seriously. I mean, because no one's going to do that in the last hole of the US Open. You're going to lay it up and you're going to try and win the tournament. <laughs> but it, anyway, I, I don't know the answer. What's, what's your what's your thinking on that, Michael? I mean, I like, even though I cite Caddyshack all the time and I know the movie well, I really think it's a, it's of course it's so bad it's good it's in that category as our friend and colleague Gary Vincent used to say it's so bad it's good it really is so bad that it's good, but so but short of Caddyshack and there are some clever moments in Caddyshack, you know it's just it is a thing unto itself. Aside from Caddyshack, there's really not one golf movie that I would that I've even bothered to watch more than a, more than a second time. You know, Tommy's honor tried so hard, but was so earnest. Uh, Tin Cup was so all, all over the lot. Let's not even talk about that, if we may say the name, that Will Smith dripping molasses thing. What was that called? The Legend of Bagger Vance. The Hogan B- movie. Vance. You know, from, Don't say the name. From the 50s. is heinous uh, with John Ford, if that's his name. Uh, uh, did you ever see Alan? Uh, and I know this hits close to home for us. I've never saw it. There is a there is a movie version of Golf in the Kingdom. Are you familiar with it? Have you seen it? 
Oh yeah. Yeah. It was filmed. It was filmed at Band and Dunes in the early when right. Bandon had just was like just raw basically. And, um, I have watched it. It's kind of a mess in, in not in a terrible way because the book is like that as well. I mean, the second half of the book, especially, um, it's, it's, it's worth watching and you should probably microdose mushrooms while you do it. It's just, um, <laughs> it's metaphysical and kind of trippy, but it's worthwhile. I don't know. I think the actual drama of golf is so compelling. Like if you watched our five episodes of the grind, which you can find on the fire pit YouTube or on our, our homepage, like that human drama is, is so compelling. If you, if you follow, you know, some of these, these stories of these guys, they're, they're playing for their livelihood. Um, it's, it's such raw human emotion. And so it just, it, it doesn't quite translate to the screen. I don't, because the, those, those stakes are stripped away. I don't know. Cause it, it is a mystery in that movies can reproduce all walks of life. I mean, and they can, they can make you care about professions that you've, you, you're never going to experience or interact with. And so they should be able to do it with golf. Maybe, I don't know, maybe we're too close to it. Maybe the average viewer enjoys some of the movies that drive us crazy. Well, I love a good um, movie discussion, but let, let's just talk about the early week drama. Uh, the, the Academy Award for Best Actor in a Press Conference goes to Jay Monahan, who uh, did his annual State of the Union press conference on Wednesday and said, everything's hunky-dory, we're doing great, nothing, nothing to see here. It's been funny to chart his, uh, you know, two, uh, last year at, at, the, at, the, at the players, it was like, we're about legacy, not leverage. We're moving on. Well, that didn't quite work out. And um, now there's been a whole year of live golf, or half a year anyway, and Monahan came in and, and talked about the state of things. You were there, Michael. What was your take on Monahan's performance and, and then the related news about, you know, how the tour is reshaping itself. We, we talked already about, um, you know, the cuts or the, the no cuts, but in a previous podcast, but just the, the feeling on the ground at Sawgrass is, as, as this is, you know, players championship has become an important week for charting the course of the PGA tour. What were your thoughts on that? It, it, the, you know, as we have seen at the, uh, at the masters and in the U S open, especially to some degree, the British open, uh, these pre-tournament press conferences, uh, from the, uh, from the men and, and one woman who are, have such important positions in the game are really important for setting the tone for the game. I don't know if they should be or not, but they're, they're very much directed to people like us, uh, you know, and can you win over the constituency? Uh, and if you think about where, where Jay was in 2020 versus 22 and 23, you know, 20 is dealing with the, uh, the uncertainty of, of the pandemic washing ashore and 22, it was, you know, fisticuffs and, uh, we'll show you. And, uh, and 23, he was really very confident, very informed. And, uh, he gave you the feeling that, uh, this PGA tour is going to, is going to carry on. Um, so, you know, to use the word you used, Alan, I think it's an appropriate one as a performance. It was very effective. If you dig into the numbers, I just don't see how 20 and $25 million purses and $5 million paydays. I just don't see how that is sustainable when you have weeks like this week's when, uh, when the tournament is just not that compelling, who's, who's going to be watching, uh, I don't know. I don't know where, you know, there, 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 he bought a year very cleverly. He took up, he, he, he really did, uh, take part of Phil Mickelson's playbook and, and made it the tours, uh, when it's all said and done. Uh, but they're so focused on these elite players at the expense of the journeyman. And I think at the expense of the fan, I really, I'm not, I'm not at all a financial analyst type person. I'm not good at that at all, but I just don't see how this is sustainable. Uh, how about you, Alan? You've, you've delved much deeper into the, to the numbers of where golf is right now. Uh, what, what's your sense of just as a numbers game is what Jay Monahan is preaching. Is it sustainable? 
Well, and I'll add to that today, um, Aramco released its earnings and it had made a record amount of money. I think it was 141 billion in the last the last quarter. I can't remember the number. It was an astronomical number, and of course, that's what feeds into the the Saudi Public Investment Fund, and that's what's that's what's floating Live Golf. So, when people talk about you know Live having unlimited resources, it's basically true. In the PGA Tour, it's much more finite and. You know, I did a story a few days ago. Where I, I got a tournament director on the phone of a, a non-elevated event, and he opened a vein and was speaking for a lot of his colleagues. It's a real challenge to get corporations to sign up for these these non-elevated events because they're not getting the eyeballs, they're not getting the players. The price is only going up, and you know, as uh, as another as a, a Silicon Valley bank collapses and that throws the whole tech world into question, like. They just lost Dell computers. How are you going to keep finding a company to put in 15, 18 million dollars for a regular event and 25 to 28 for an elevated? It, it's a tough sell. Um, I think there's going to have to be some contraction of the schedule. Um, and then that reduces playing opportunities for the journeyman. Uh, there's going to be some tough decisions ahead for, for the, the PGA Tours organization. You know whether that means the senior tour, maybe that means Latino America, uh, or China, or Canada. But if they're gonna, if the entire institutional focus is on the top players, and everyone else is gonna feel some pain, and um, so I, I think, you know, it's been a fun first three months of the season. I mean, elevated events have definitely added some energy to the whole thing, and it's not only has it been a talking point, but it's been some great golf, and we we are all enjoying seeing the top players together. But the long term is very much in question, and you know, the, the center has held for twenty three. Uh, we're going to find out more about who re ups or doesn't in twenty four and twenty five, and that that's going to have a huge effect on the future of the PGA Tour. And if there is a lot of attrition among the sponsors. Um, then finding a middle ground with Live becomes a lot more attractive because if you could keep this energy with all these players and, and you could have someone else pay for it, that would be the dream, right? So, uh, you know, I like this idea of bringing, letting the Live players back on the PGA Tour, but they have to play the non elevated events. Like, that'd be great for everybody. You get all the stars that if they want to play a half dozen times and, and try and play their way into some bigger events. Um, I don't know. There's various people, whether it's Rory or, or Rom or whoever, have, have have talked about the need to find a compromise. And as the financials play out, and as sponsors leave the PGA Tour, that's going to add more pressure to the whole thing. So the last chapter has not been written in my book or or the, this this long saga. It's uh, I don't think we're going to know for a while how what what it all means. I, so. Um, you know, I, I think Jay Monahan definitely did what he had to do, and he had that 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 sound of confidence in his voice. But I'm not sure how much that was acting and how much that was was legit. Well, Alan, Alan before we click off here, uh, uh, you're off to Tucson, Arizona, for the first uh, live yes. event in the United States uh, uh, this year. What are your expectations for it? Uh, are we sort of at a moment of business as usual or is there never anything usual with, with, with live golf? <laughs> no, I think so. You know, last year was, was just this chaotic, uh, just trying to, trying to build the organization while conducting tournaments. Now the whole model's baked out. The teams are set. The players are set. No one, there's going to be no, no new players are going to be added and no, there's going to be no attrition. I mean, barring injury. And even then they have a, they have a few guys on standby to fill in like an Andy Ogletree or a Laurie Cantor. So I think it's going to be, it's going to be almost boring in that it's going to look and feel very much like the Mayakoba event did team uniforms. That was fun and fresh the first time. Now it's going to be okay. Um, you know, I think, Again, to quote Jay Monahan, it's product against product. So this will, you know, we're we're going to see how what the level of play is on on a, a course that has a long history of the PGA Tour. Of course, the match play was out there at, at that at that venue in Tucson, and um, it's it's the biggest question around live golf. Can it actually generate interest just in the golf? It's been living on buzz and hype and intrigue and drama um, this whole time. At some point, the golf has to take center stage. And, 
you know, if you get, if you get Phil wins, if you get a Brooks Dustin shootout, you know, if Cam Smith goes 30 under, then I think people will pay attention. If, if Charles Howe, you know, kind of cruises to victory, uh, it's going to be hard to draw the eyeballs. So, um, you know, there, there was, there's a, it's funny how everyone cooks the books, what the ratings were, who, how many people actually tuned in, um, on the CW and on the app and all that, the numbers that Liv put out were pretty robust. Um, what some other folks cited were significantly smaller. So we need more of a sample size. And I, I think, you know, if they can, uh, if they can draw a good crowd, electronically that, that would be a huge step forward and try and create some viewing habits by now everyone knows about where they can watch live not only on the cw but they've launched their own platform for streaming and um, so i think it's going to feel like a golf tournament i don't think it's going to feel like a sideshow that mean that's good or bad depending on your perspective because the live has kind of needed the sideshow but um i'm looking forward to seeing it um uh, and continuing just to report on what's going on out there. But I, I guess my expectations are low from an intrigue standpoint. And I, from a competitive standpoint, we'll see. Okay, well, it's very late in Ponte Vedra Beach where Michael Bamberger has already typed a story and done a podcast. The guy is tireless. Um, we're going to let Michael get some rest. But always a fun conversation. These Sunday night fire drills. Uh, we'll keep them coming. Uh, Augusta National is only three or four weeks away, so it's time to get excited about that. Uh, I was already excited, but uh, you know the players really is a benchmark. So I think we have we have an idea of, of who the favorites are heading into Augusta, even though we already had a hunch. But um, as always, thanks for listening. We appreciate your fidelity. Uh, that was Michael Bamberger. This is Alan Shipnut signing off from this fire drill, and we'll do it again next week. Thanks. I got thoughts in my head, can't get them out. Trying not to think what I'm thinking about I've got thoughts in my head Can't get them out Trying not to think what